We wanted to bring you our Chief Technology and Innovation Officer, Alan Beam, to come and talk to you about some of the innovations that are going on for Procter & Gamble. Uh, we're actually coming straight off of CES, right? How many people were at CES this year? Yeah. It's kind of surreal doing CES and then Davos. I mean, <laughs> it's, been, it's been awesome, but one of the things that you're going to see is, as a company, um, a lot of people were asking us, well, why would you get into blockchain? Like, why was blockchain important for a company like Procter & Gamble? Don't you make consumer products? The reality is, we actually look very deeply into every type of emerging technology. And the reason is, is because we're at the forefront of consumer experience. And the reality is, if a consumer is looking for an experience, we should be able to deliver that experience, and it shouldn't actually matter how we've crafted that. But what does matter is that it's secure. <laughs> what does matter is that we're able to ensure that consumers have choice. And what does matter is that the experience is seamless. So we're going to play um, a couple reels for you just before I bring Alan on. Um, Alan has been in the technology disruptive space for over 20 years. He thinks about the big picture and how to get a company like Procter & Gamble, which is huge, 95,000 employees, making the shift towards areas of innovation that become important for us. So take a look at some of the work that we're doing through the videos, and then um, you'll have Alan being next. Thank you so much. That is a 50 liter home. It's one of our sustainability initiatives. We have a pavilion at, on the promenade at 109. Feel free to go by and take a look. This is from CES this year. Thank you. Um, so as, as Tanya said, I've, I've been involved in digital transformation, innovation, whatever you want to call it, for 20 plus years for uh, companies such as Coca-Cola, ING, uh, Juniper Networks, um, General Electric, now Procter & Gamble. And 
I think it's, it's I, I learned early on that uh, in order to innovate, uh, you really have to take risks and you have to put yourself out there. And I think that's, that's why you find people like myself that usually last about three years or four years at a company and we either get bored or we get kicked out because we've caused so much disruption. But as, as our chief operating officer says, you know, as long as it's constructive disruption, it's good. And, and that's what we aim to do. So I thought what I would do is um, make this very interactive, let you ask questions, but, but at the same time just talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing at Procter & Gamble, some of the things that I've seen work elsewhere and not work in, in a variety of areas. Um, I think this year, uh, as we look going forward, you know, blockchain is still, it's still rather in its nascent stages. Uh, but there's other technologies that are also coming up that are going to change how we do things. So at, at this point in our thinking going into, the, into our next year, our calendar year, our fiscal year starts in, in July, so we're right in the middle of planning, is that we're looking at, a, at taking some technological approaches that combine things like blockchain and mixed reality, 5G, of course artificial intelligence is a given, um, and really betting heavily on edge computing. And we think more and more things are going to move to the edge, that the clouds are going to continue to really decline other than for some basic transactional type of in environments. And that's going to create an environment where we have to start meshing devices at the edge. And blockchain will play a very important part, not just in being able to validate the individuals and the data, but actually validating the devices as being part of an accepted chain in order to do the, the, tr the, uh, the processing. So it's a pretty exciting time. The, the challenge you have, and I've seen it at, at other companies, is you can't just do technology for technology's sake because that gets thrown out. So what we've been doing is we've been going out within different functions in P&G, and we, we started this uh, just a few weeks back, um, and we're going out and we're, we're doing what I'm calling the matching funds game. And this is always a great way to, to get things going, where you have business people or functions that want to, to get something done. They have a real business problem, but they never have the money. And I've seen this over and over again. They don't have the money until they can actually prove there's a return. And when you start looking at some of the technologies, the newer technologies as you're trying to move forward, the return's not always guaranteed because there's a risk factor you have to overcome. So one of the tricks that I've learned over the years is to set up a matching funds pool, going into the marketing organization, going into the finance organization and saying, look, it, the, the technology group will put up $500,000 if you put up $500,000 to solve this. Or I'm going to put up two fifty, dollars you put up one fifty, dollars Or even going out and finding partners and you start pooling the money. Once you get the first implementation and you do it in a matching basis, as soon as the thing becomes a uh, part of the daily routine for that function, you now have the ability to transfer the co ongoing operating costs and so what I call sort of turning it into a platform for the future. So we're doing this, we, we've done this with some, some of our blockchain projects. We certainly are going to be doing it with mixed reality and augmented reality. They, augmented reality is one of the things that we brought into uh, our pavilion. Please come, come visit the pavilion. I think it's number 109? 109. 109 on the promenade. Um, but it was very, con very much con confined space, so how do you make the most of confined space? You create an, a virtual world or an augmented world in order to give people the feeling that, uh, that they are in something much bigger and broader. So we did this at, as we've been doing this at Procter & Gamble, a lot of the same things at Coke, a lot of the innovations at Coke were things like the freestyle machine, which pours 200 and some odd beverages um, from a typical machine that used to pour six. We did a lot of, of work in, uh, in and around the Olympics, um, and especially in, in, in Rio when I was there, uh, by using digitization in order to have people create a flag and really had a, we had a flag printed and put it out on the pitch and at the same time created a digital version. Again, here's something where blockchain may have been able to come into play as we were starting to put the pieces together and being able to identify who owns what piece and there's different things that you can do, but this of course was, was many years ago and, and sort of predated the technology. The, the only thing that we know is that technology keeps advancing and therefore we have to always keep looking for the future. I was at a dinner at CES with a with uh, I guess a couple of our customers and uh, uh, some VCs and others. And we, we got into the talk and said, why don't corporations such as ours take more moonshots? And, and that's really, I think, the area that we all fall down. And that, that if you think of how a, a VC or an investor manages their portfolio, uh, for every 10 investments they make, they're hoping that one is going to be huge and big. And that'll pay back the entire fund. Two or three are going to make some money and get a nice return, they're going to have two that break even and they're going to write off five. And that seems to be the pattern that's over and over again. 
Yet when we come into corporations, we expect everything to have a payback, everything to be 100% covering its own costs. We don't have that same tolerance, and that's why we don't take risks. So we have to start changing that, and one way to change that is to do moonshots. And if you look at what's going on in the, in the space industry today, you have, you have a Blue Origin, you have SpaceX, you have Moon Express, you have many others that are really doing moonshots. And they're being able to do things and apply technology and apply different approaches that, quite honestly, were all available to NASA and ESA and all the, support, uh, the agencies around the world for years. But they just didn't do it. And it took the entrepreneurial spirit to be able to show that these things can be done. And I'm, I really believe that this is the year for P&G and this is the year for corporations to start thinking about what is your moonshot? Because if you don't take the moonshot, someone else is going to come in and do it to you and you're going to be left behind. So happy to take some, some questions. I said I've, I've been in uh, multiple industries. Um, I always say you know, one of the first things I was involved in inventing, and people always hate me for this, is uh, you know, does everybody know the term yield management? So you know, you're sitting next to somebody on the airplane that's paid half as much as the seat for you. So I was one of the people that invented that uh, way back when. So uh, I, usually, I usually say that as I'm leaving the room. <laughs> but um, I've, I've had some, some interesting opportunities to apply technology to create new capabilities and happy to discuss them, happy to even just brainstorm ideas how we can all work together to try to change things as well. I'm just curious, what are the top three corporate goals that Procter & Gamble has where you feel blockchain can make an impact? Um, you know, I think, you know, so P&G, just a little history before I answer the questions, P&G went through uh, some major changes this past year. Um, we're really decentralizing the company. Uh, we now have six CEOs that are aligned in the market uh, that have end-to-end P&L uh, responsibility. We have uh, functions in a corporate center that's shrinking in order to be supportive to the, um, uh, to the business units. And the business units themselves are, are distributed in, I say, clustered together based on some common products and, and brands that they have. So if you think about blockchain, you think about the distributed nature of blockchain itself, you start thinking about how the enterprise works. Um, it actually provides, the, has the ability to provide trust and transparency between these various individual business units that used to be centered. So one is, how are these business units going to actually relate to each other. Second, you're going to have things now coming up where you're going to have to have financial settlements between the business units because they are independent business units. So at some point, the, the, the beauty business unit is going to be have something to do with grooming. There's going to have to be some type of financial settlement. You're going to have to, to, to assure that the trade promotion actually went off, that the coupons were, were in, in fact uh, applied properly, and then you're going to have to have a financial settlement. Again, great opportunity for distributed ledger, um, and we're going to see it. So I think as businesses start, and I, and I think we're going to see a lot more decentralization coming because it's awfully hard to run a $70 billion business at top down. And as you start seeing this go out in other businesses, that's where we're going to see the ability for blockchain to start providing the glue to, to hold the corporations together and allow them to grow. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Francesco. I'm from uh, the University College of London and uh, for the Center for Blockchain Technologies. And my question to you, I really like what you say regarding partnership and collaborations and taking risks, especially from big multinational corporations like, like PNG. Um, I want to ask you, uh, what do you think about the role of universities and educational institutions with that? I mean, we've always partnered with, with universities. We do a lot of of research and secondary research to universities. Um, I, I personally um, sit on advisory boards at Carnegie Mellon University of San Francisco. I lecture at Berkeley. I, I lecture at <coughs> other places. So um, there is a very tight uh, formal and informal relationships that, that go on within the academic community. Uh, I, I think the, the, the area where I get the most excitement, quite honestly, is, is uh, working uh, and spending time with a lot of the PhD students and getting advanced looks at their dissertations um, and seeing what, what their mind is in the future. At the same time, this is, a, this is going to sound crazy, but universities are doing wonderful things, but universities, as you, get into, as you get into school, what I've learned over the years is that you end up being trained in certain, uh, called certain methods based on the 
instructors that you've seen, the books that you've read. And even though you're, you're much better off in a university than you are, say, 20 years down the line because you have more freedom of thought, I've been actually spending a lot of time with 14 and 15 year olds. And I found some amazing 14 and 15 year olds um, that have uh, developed their own currencies for their classrooms and are doing other things and, and they're using uh, they're, they're using blockchain actually to, to do this. So I, I don't think that we should limit ourselves to thinking about um, say universities or high schools or, or, or post-grad. Um, sometimes it's best to look at the kids because there's a lot more creativity in the kids and we can act as mentors and we do, I personally do a lot of work with STEM as well. But go spend some time with some really smart 14 and 15 year olds. Give them a business problem and, 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 and educate them on some of the technologies that are available and how it can be used to solve it. You'll be amazed at what these kids will come up with that you can then take in and refine, either in a lab in a university or in a corporation. So you think high schools can do that? Um, I, I think some ways high schools are late. Um, and I, I think that, that middle school um, is, in the middle school is probably the appropriate time because the, the, the kids, and I've seen this in different parts of the world, seems to, once the kids hit into high school, I don't want to say they're lost, but they're lost, okay? They're, they're, they're already worried about peer pressure. They're, they already have the direction that they're going. Um, sort of that, that, that tail end of middle school, they, they still have the ability to think they don't, they don't feel confined as much. But I don't say don't deal with high school kids. But the earlier you get kids, the bigger the impact you have. We certainly see this in STEM as we try to build more and more uh, you know, young women and get them into, into uh, engineering and technical professions. You have to start early because that's the only way that you can hook them before people tell them this, you shouldn't do this because you're a female. So, so you put it all together. I, think I would always say air, air younger. Yes, yeah, um, my name is Ken, Ken Wong uh, from Chinese Blockchain Delegate. Um, I, what I observe is currently is a big op, uh, corporation like uh, your company is doing the digital transformation. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, undergoing, right? But it's really uh, like supported by a convergence of technology, AI, blockchain, cloud, edge computing you just mentioned, and uh, the security, uh, all this. Uh, is there an, a sort of an approach you try to put it in a layered architecture? It's kind of like uh, the original internet is based on ISO, uh, seven layer architecture, <laughs> right? From physical layer to application layer. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I think the blockchain as a value-based uh, internet potentially will be beneficial to have a layered architecture as well. Maybe underneath, on the First layer is the network, it's like 5G network, which really can increase the block propagation, right? it's, it's, it will be fast and increase the speed and the throughput, and also it will be secure. <coughs> so the network and then you have the identity layer. That's very important. Uh, in the internet world, uh, the traditional internet, there's no identity layer, even in the ISO, uh, seven layer or the internet four layer. So that's why the majority of the security problem is because of identity, the access control. So I think we are currently very in a very good time to have a self-solving identity and build actually on the protocol layer of the uh, this value-based economy, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, uh, then you can have a data layer. After that, once you have data uh, identity, you can have the ownership, ownership of identity. Right. So, it's, uh, right, right, right. So, so the question is: uh, uh, Is there any thoughts in your company about a potentially layered architecture for this value-based economy or internet? Well, I mean, if you just go back historically, um, abstraction is, has been a key for. 30, 40 years now. And, and as long as you, you practice abstraction, that's going to get you layers by nature. But I think that the, the future relies in context. And when you start talking about identity, you start talking about security, that's just contextual information that's associated with some, with some data or with a, something that you're going to be moving. I, I think that 
um, blockchain can play a role in helping to define context. And I don't want to say just identity because that's part of it. The, you know, the, just on, on a personal note, um, <clears throat> so I, I, I've been around a while. And so I've got the gray hairs and everything else. But I actually grew up with a gentleman named Leonard Kleinrock. Um, and uh, his, his daughters were playmates of mine. If you look up Leonard Kleinrock, Dr. Kleinrock sent the first message over the internet. So he really invented the internet. I never knew what my, my friends, my playmates' friends' father was doing. All I knew was he was at UCLA, and I got to go to UCLA when I was a, a small kid and play in the labs and things. But, um, I, you know, and I've asked him, what, what would you do different? And he said, he said, you know, he says the entire internet needs to be changed because it was never built for what it's being used for today. And it gets back into the whole concept of context. It gets into the concept of trust. And there are different technologies, including blockchain, that will have the ability to plan this in the future. Well, I think um, you need to go, is that right? Or do you have time for another question? Alan, how do you feel? I'm fine. Is okay, okay. okay. I'm going to get coffee um, after We're going to take this, this one here. <laughs> we'll go to Dan. Okay. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am Kirsa Salomon. Keep it brief, I've, I've worked in your industry, detergents, before. And in this environment of climate change that is in, in Davos this year, uh, I think that the big challenge for the industry of detergents, uh, your industry, cosmetics, is the reduction of plastics. How, how the, the industry will re, uh, reduce the plastics in coming years. Is, is any use of blockchain that you have in mind to, to get this, this challenge for this industry? Well, we're part of a consortium loop, I think it's... it's the Hi, I'm Daniel from Orbs and Hexa Group. I wanted to ask, uh, in your perspective, what is the flagship blockchain project within the group and what is the internal goal to get it to the market? And secondly, if you think the hurdle is more technological or political to get all the players on board? You know, I, I think you know, when, when you have a corporation the size of PNG, you, you, there, really, there really is never a flagship because it's, uh, there's something that, that has business value that's delivered specifically, and, and I'll just get to the direct answer here in a second, but um, one thing that I've learned over the years is there's no such thing as a corporation. That if you start breaking down large corporations, what you find is that inside the corporation, there's actually, you have treasury departments. Treasury departments can produce a billion dollars and more in profit, therefore it's a bank. You have, you look in the size of a large corporation that does manufacturing. You look in a large size of a corporation, it actually comes up, not just a media buyer, but it can actually be creating media. So. You can't look across and, and say that there's something that's going to impact everybody because anything you do with any technology or solution is really only going to impact and get the attention of one function. So the thing that probably got the most uh, notoriety here uh, for us was container tracking. And that was something that we, we did a, a, you know, a year, year and a half ago. And, and the reason is that the containers, if you look at it, the dwell time of containers in a port, the more, the more that the ship, the more uh, turns you can make on the ship, it saves money. You have products that don't, uh, that have longer shelf lives because it gets into the shelf. So that gets a lot of visibility. But quite honestly, 
the people in the marketing department and advertising group don't care, the people in the other organizations, they just don't care. So you, you really have to break it into which function or which company within the corporation you're dealing with, and each one needs its own flagship. Hi, um, yeah, we're a group of researchers that uh, do management consulting basically, and every time we see a new use case coming from the industry, we really take a hard look at it. And when you mentioned that um, blockchain will be the glue that will help uh, companies of seven billion in revenue, or that around that number you didn't mention, uh, work. So my question is, is this really the problem that um, large organizations see that there's a lot of, I mean, blockchain is, is a, the essence is that it's helping non-trusting people or entities connect together. Is that really the problem we're seeing like a lot of internal fraud and people that are um, manipulating data for their own purposes, but this is stopping um, organizations from going further? Um. You know, with, with not, not, and purposely not addressing fraud or something like that. The reality is you get any large group of people together and there's relationships that exist. Some are stronger than others. There's a series of trust even within people in the room here based on, on maybe your academic credentials, maybe based on work that you've done. You, you infer a certain level of trust or, or infer a level of trust on somebody else. It happens in corporations. The bigger the corporation, the, the, the more the different people that you have, um, you, you need to do something. So there, there is always um, just sort of bringing people together to make a decision in order for a business process, whether it is financial, whether it is um, a, a, a manufacturing process, you have to have trust. And I've seen year after year, corporation after corporation, uh, things don't get done because you don't trust the person who's going to make it happen. And you have to find some way to, to actually prove that the process that somebody did what they said they were going to do. So um, this, it, it doesn't answer your question specifically, but what it really is, is saying is that any large distributed group of people or, or systems or processes does require as an opportunity to apply technologies such as blockchain and others in order to, to be the glue to pull things together. I don't know where it's going to go because we're still at, that, at the very beginning of a hockey stick. Great. So um, we're going to take maybe two more questions. So I just want to canvas the room. Who else has questions? <coughs> Danny, you do? Okay. We'll have Danny. Hi, Danny from Wards. Um, I, I, I actually want to refer to something uh, that Tanya said yesterday on the panel, which uh, was mind blowing to me. Um, that on the importance of corporation experimentation to be shared with the world. Um, which is a cultural business practice that we don't really see today and how important it is uh, to, to share the failures. What didn't work so others don't repeat it, don't repeat. so how are you planning to do this? Um, so so we've, we've formed in some areas what I'll call some consortiums which are, are non-competitive people where you can get together and you can share things openly and transparently and, and in fact it actually helps accelerate innovation when, when you're working in that type of an environment. Um, you know, as a, as a publicly traded company, you are always concerned about what you say will have some type of a positive or negative impact on, on your, market, your market cap. So um, you have to be careful of what you say, you have to be careful of the time of the, the, time of the, the quarter that you say it and all of those things. So I, I believe that these, these opening these things up, putting things that are, um, that there are better for society and better in, in, for the public in general, working on those problems and sharing those and publish them, that's no different than what happens with research and, and educational institutions. And to be honest with you, that's okay. But there's always going to be certain things that you, you have to hold tight. You've tried something that could give you a competitive advantage and you don't want to telegraph either a, a victory or a failure to your competitors or to the market. And those you'll have to hold back. So it's case by case. One final one. Final question, actually related to what you just said. It's Keith Mitzelmacher from Block Accelerator. I haven't introduced myself. Um, I, I see the biggest barrier to adoption in blockchain is the fact that you have to get multiple parties and stakeholders to agree to do the same thing. Um, how do you get, even within one organization, to get multiple business units to buy into getting on the same single version of truth system and use it? It's, I hate to say it, there isn't an easy way to do it. You know, inside a company, outside of a company or between companies, it's actually easier because there's a dominant party. 
and the dominant party can flex its muscles and can insist that things are done in such a way otherwise that, that uh, the participants will no longer be the participant and you move on to the next one. And that's just that's the hammer approach which you have the ability to do. It. You, want, you want to do business with me, I'm the, the biggest one in the room, then you're going to do what I say. When you get into a corporation, it doesn't work that way because um, everybody is equal. I always say everyone is equal, but some people are more equal than others. Um, and and, I, and I, I really believe that. But the challenge is it's all through negotiation. And whoever has the best negotiation skills is going to win. The two things that I do for my teams to give them a, a, a leg up, and I've been doing this for a number of years, is there's, there's two soft skills that I always send my, my teams to. Tanya hasn't done this yet, but she will be. Is, is one is I put people through negotiation training class. Salespeople go through it all the time. Why don't people that are trying to pull things together? Because blockchain is about negotiation and you negotiate. The other thing that people sort of laugh at, and it's, and it's meant to be laughed at, is I put people through improvisation training. And I bring comedians in, and we actually do improv training. And the reason is, as you're negotiating, as you're trying to put these things together, you have to think on your feet. The people that think on their feet know how to deflect issues and be able to recover better than anybody else are improvisationists. The comedians can do this better than anyone. So I've had great success by, by instilling those two capabilities along with the technical knowledge, whether it's blockchain or another subject, and it always gives my organization a leg up in trying to move forward. So blockchain for improv. Thank you, Alan. And we couldn't do anything that, that we do in this space without amazing partners. And GBBC has been a phenomenal partner in connecting us to people who are thought leaders here, who are eager to experiment with us and try new things. So Sandra, thank you very much. I actually want to mention, this year at CES was the first time the Consumer Technology Association had blockchain main stage. That's true. And we were on it. It was pretty awesome. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone.